Zooming in on music. Hello everybody. My name is Michael Gila. I'm viola player in the Concertgebouw Orchestra in Amsterdam and artistic director of Music Stages, a small cultural organization in Amsterdam. Today, I have the great privilege to talk to one of my heroes, a true viola hero, Lawrence Power. Welcome, Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Very nice to see you after yeah. quite a few years. Yeah, I think it, it must have been about 15 years or so since you played Marta Concerto with us, wasn't it? Yeah, quite possibly. Yes, something like that. Yeah, um, and yeah absolutely. And it's ni nice to, to catch up finally. I mean, uh, I think I need introduction much more than you do. Uh, Lawrence Power is, of course, uh, a renowned soloist and, and he has been performing concerts all over the world. He plays recitals and chamber music and he has some great recordings on his name, especially his Hindemith and, and York Bowen, which I love. And most recently, uh, Lawrence has engaged in a project called the Lockdown Commissions. So clearly he's somebody who is using this crisis to create something new, something meaningful. And I would like uh, to speak to him about that. And uh, apart from all that, Lawrence is also a teacher at the Hochschule in Zürich. So Lawrence, how are you doing now? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. I mean, just like we were, we were talking, I, I feel very fortunate, you know, the, the music world is going through a really difficult time at the moment, as everybody is, but um, certainly in the UK, and I think probably in Holland as well, I mean, the freelance musicians have really been hit very badly by this situation. And I, I count myself as one of the lucky few, you know, I, I teach as well, and I have a beautiful family and we're all healthy. So, you know, I, I feel very, very, very fortunate during this time, and I think in a way, this is a time when, of course, putting the tragedy of our profession to one side and there's no there are no concerts and there's very hard to travel. Actually, it's become a time for me of of real sort of um, questioning uh, of sort of asking many, many questions that we don't really have time to ask when we're playing concerts. Um, how you present music, what you want to say in music what you want to um, sort of bring to the world musically. And in a way, when you're doing concerts, you're just, you feel very fortunate that you're being asked to perform. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. But actually when, when all of that stops and you're left with that one question, <laughs> which is what can you do now that is creative? That's actually a very hard question to answer. And I think we've all been faced with that. And, um, you know, at the beginning of the whole lockdown thing, as we all know, there was this amazing time. I found it incredible where everyone just wanted to play. They wanted to play their Bach to the camera. They wanted to just keep playing and they wanted to just show that they can do it. And I, you know, I have respect for everyone who does anything, but it just seemed to me like it was a time to really think about what we want to put onto the internet because <laughs> what you put on the internet will last for a very long time. Um, and it just felt like a good time to, um, create something for the new medium and that new medium is um, the screen and for me this is the biggest question because and I'm sure you find this with your orchestra it's a it's a big question of how do you present your music on screen without an audience because for me it's meaningless without an audience a performance there is no performance um, it's a different thing so the idea of doing a streamed concert without an audience which of course I'm very happy to do and I do it a lot. I'm very grateful to do it, but I'm really fascinated by this question of what is the musical merit of doing a concert to an empty concert hall? Of course, it's very special and it's important to make the gesture, but what I feel, feel more excited about is developing the idea of music video of how you can film things for the screen in an interesting way. And I feel that we're now in our infancy. I think everyone is kind of realizing that whether it's we have to film things in a more interesting way or we have to program in a different way. But one thing's for sure, we can't just expect people to watch an empty concert hall performance of a Brahms symphony for the next year. And 
I'm just I'm really interested and excited by that challenge. And so the lockdown commissions I did, I mean, that's just a little part of that, really. And it was a lovely way to invite composers that I know to write short pieces for me and to film them in empty halls in an interesting way. Um, so that whole idea sort of started with that. And it's kind of snowballed now. And I've just I've actually just started a very small production company with the filmmaker I'm working with. And the whole idea of it is about how we can connect all of these different art forms at this time where we're all so, we're so sort of, um, we've stopped what we're doing and we're, we're kind of separated. Um, and I'm really interested in how can I collaborate now with dancers, with musicians, with actors. Um, and I, I think it's, in a way, that's an exciting time because we would never have time to do that properly during the normal season. Yeah, I, I think you're really going straight to the point this is what you also do in your playing you're just hitting hitting the 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 soft spot in in a way and and this is exactly how, how i felt too is if everybody is is starting to 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 scream on the screen like i'm alive look i can play i can I, i'm playing this for you and i'm what what does it mean in the end and how can we how can we add some some meaning to it? And and this yes. is also one of the reasons why why I started this little uh, video blog because mm -hmm. because I'm I'm dying to hear from creative people like you to what their thoughts are and and how they how how they see the challenges and and what they do with them. But I, I would like to start a little bit to go a little bit back because because. Obviously, you are known as a as a musician and as a soloist, but uh, but just to introduce you a little more, you 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 were an international traveler. I mean, you went all over the place. You you spent a lot of time in Australia, and and, and you teach in Zurich. You live in England. I assume you still live in, in Great Britain. So uh, so life has changed. Uh, drastically uh, for you. I mean, more for me because I, for me, I, I just stayed where I am, and my orchestra luckily is still playing. But for somebody like you, who used to be a traveling, glamorous soloist, uh, how did that affect your being? How what what did? How how do you feel about it? Are, are you regretting it? Do you do you? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think actually it's sort of. I think this whole time is an interesting sort of uh, experiment because I think it sort of exposes different kinds of personalities and it's fantastic what you're doing. I think everyone in their own way has to be positive and creative. And I think in life there are people that see the positives. <laughs> they, they see the glass half full and there are people who see the glass half empty. There's just human nature. Um, and luckily I feel I'm one of the people that sees the glass half full. So I don't, firstly, I don't consider myself or I never consider myself a glamorous soloist because I mean, I, a big part of what I do is collaboration. I mean, I love collaborating with orchestras, but I love collaborating in chamber music and teaching. And for me, it's the whole thing. So I don't feel too, I don't feel too sad about that because I feel very fortunate that I'm able to keep surviving. <laughs> um, and I just, I'm very grateful for that. But in terms of the change of lifestyle, um, I think I'm just I'm a bit too preoccupied at the moment with what I want to do. So yeah. maybe that's just maybe it's a defense mechanism. <laughs> maybe I'm maybe I'm just absolutely terrified that <laughs> I've, stopped, I've stopped the one thing I can do. But may but actually I more seriously I find it fascinating that we all started playing music very early. I mean personally I only started playing when I was like 7 or 8. So I kind of had a childhood but there are lots of our, there are lots of our colleagues. They started at age three or four. They can't even remember not playing an instrument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and they never know anything else. And I've always been fascinated by that idea that maybe I should probably take a sabbatical and think about think about what else I want to develop in my life rather than just be on the the treadmill like the hamster going round and round. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, you know, so to answer your question in a very English roundabout way, uh, I don't feel in any way, I feel quite um, grateful that I'm able to explore some other possibilities at the moment. And actually, I, I do think 
I've always been kind of um, challenged about the kinds of audiences we play to. You know, I feel that we live in a very privileged bubble as musicians. Mm. And I, you know, I've, I'm very privileged to be part of that. But I do think in, certainly in the UK, maybe less so in, in, in the rest of Europe, but I feel there is this big divide between what I do and the regular part of society. And I, I'm kind of passionate about seeing what I can do musically that maybe crosses over that barrier a bit more. Yeah. Because yeah. the majority of people, they don't go to the Wigmore Hall and watch a Beethoven string quartet. They don't go to the Festival Hall in London. And it's not to do with money, because it's cheaper to go to a, it's cheaper than the going to a football match. It's, it's to do with perception. And I sort of, I'm really enjoying this time to try and just sort of reach out in a more, in a more sort of pure way to, to get your music out there. I, I think we live in a world which is, we're, we're very worried about a small bandwidth of people and actually to bring music to the to a bigger public is a beautiful concept and i really i'm happy to try that now yeah but but of course when concerts come back if they come back i will be so happy because it's the most beautiful thing to do a live concert and we all appreciate that now we miss it because it's the greatest thing to do a live concert with people in one concert hall a full concert about i mean that's the most beautiful thing yeah and, you know i miss it but i don't want to waste my time missing it because it might not happen for another year let's be honest but of course uh it's it's a beautiful thing i i totally agree and and uh, i'm i'm just as privileged as you are that that mm. uh, i i can lead a life making music and even now in this lockdown that the orchestra is still going and that we are yeah it's great dreaming. uh the question is of course what does it mean and who do we do it for and i think the what you just said is if we do it for a very narrow bandwidth of people who Sorry. who feel that we speak their language and uh, this is actually one of the reasons why i started my little uh, production company or or my little foundation uh, where we we start started to reach out uh, to to new public and, and start to recreate music and repackage music to to see what can we do with uh, Matthew's passion or how can we uh, how can we make a Wagner opera in one and a half hours or or how can we seduce our public to listen to contemporary music so I think in in that sense we are we are very much on the same. Uh, yeah. wavelength um yeah absolutely i i wonder who uh who were your the people that influenced you uh, who where does this this affection for 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 new things or new where does it come from that, uh, did you always have that or 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 is something that just grew in recent years um new things I, I think as a viola player i mean definitely the situation i found myself in you know i was very lucky i did some competitions and you have some success and then you know what it's like it's so much luck involved in a profession well, I, I wouldn't know what it's like to have your kind of success oh, but... but i mean <laughs> but, you know the whole music world it's luck isn't it it's who you meet you could do one audition and you go to there and then you spend the rest of your life doing this no and, you know, excuse me i i i a sign of protest uh it's not just luck you you are just absolutely brilliant i will well, put that's, some... <laughs> sure. that's very kind but i guess i i do again I, it's it's maybe just i i do feel sort of lucky a lot of the time when i teach my students you know there is a certain i can't promise who's going to have a great life in music and you know i'm sure you know more than um like i do we know probably very very talented colleagues and friends who don't have careers because for other reasons it's too complicated so i just you know i feel happy and lucky that i do what i do um but what was your question about doing new things yeah i think as a viola player you have to do new things otherwise what do you do you end up doing the same all the time and that that, that doesn't interest me i'm not very good at doing <laughs> so you're a basically a curious person yeah maybe maybe um curious and i think as a viola player 
I just, that's my job. And I just think if you want to do your job in an interesting way, you have to sort of challenge yourself. And it's, it's quite a hard thing to not keep doing the same things as a viola, to, to sometimes say no and say, actually, I, you know, I want to do something else. And actually, you know, I, I play the violin now a lot and I'm kind of enjoying that element. Really? Yeah, I'm directing a lot. And yeah, so it's kind of, that's part of what I'm up to at the moment. And I just feel it's quite important to challenge myself all the time. And I think, yeah, I just don't like the, the idea of just becoming comfortable and just sort of, uh, because then it just goes like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing that really distinguishes you from many other people is that you have this incredible, incredible sound. Uh, where, where, where does it, I, I'm, I'm sure you have a great instrument, but you also have a feeling of uh, the way you're connected to your instrument seems very special. How, how did that come about? That this is really a specialized question and only string players and especially viola players will be interested because, because we are always somehow struggling with the sound, trying to find the right sonority. How, how, yeah. did, you, how did you go about it? Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, again, if that's true, I'm very happy. I'll take that if that's true. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, true. Not sure I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm the best person to agree with that because, I, again, I feel it's a challenge. I, I want to develop my sound every day. I'm never happy with my sound. It's like you just want to express yourself more and more. So, but in terms of um, viola playing, I was really, really lucky. From the age of 12, I had a fantastic teacher in London who wasn't a famous teacher, and that's a whole other conversation, famous teachers. Um, <laughs> he, just, he just gave me really, really great information. Um, you know, he studied uh, Max Rostal, so Carl Flesch system. And he just was like a really great teacher and actually a very interesting musician, but he never played in the lessons, never. He just would demonstrate some things with the hands. And then we would do lots of scales and lots of etudes. That was it. And then, to be honest with you, then I just sort of discovered music by myself with lots of amazing records, old records of great, great players. Um, and then I went to America to study with Karen Tuttle for a year, which actually was kind of important because her whole philosophy is about freedom. Um, but in terms of sound, I don't know, you just sort of, I guess I just sort of, I just sort of developed it myself, really. Hmm. I don't know. I've not been a very, I think my main thing is that I was never a very good student. I never really enjoyed being in music college. I found it quite, um, and not because I was advanced in any way, but I just found it a bit strange that people tell you how to vibrate. This idea of, sort <laughs> of you know, vibrate every note or it just becomes a bit limiting. You feel uncomfortable. Um, and now with my students, I'm fascinated by that because how do you make someone sound individual? Yeah, it's very hard. So, so how can you combine this on, on the one hand? I feel very much like you, uh, really, because I, I also often felt when I was still teaching at the, at the conservatory in Amsterdam, I, I felt I, I didn't feel good about it. So, somehow I felt like like I wasn't helping enough, helpful enough. And on the other hand, I was I was taking this big responsibility on promising these young people maybe a future that that they might not not have. So, so for, yeah. for me personally, that, that was a big, um, yeah, yeah. One one of Very the true. difficult difficult moments in life to to decide this is this is not for me. Although I love working with young people and I love to to yeah. to inspire them and to to uh, hand out some ideas or thoughts to them, or help them with technical things. As a matter of fact. But this yeah. this responsibility uh, and and I don't know how, how big is your class now in in Zurich? Uh, I've actually I've got seven students this this year, which is quite a lot for me. Um, and yeah, again, I think that what you just described is is the challenge of teaching. I mean, I, I constantly assess and reassess what what good it is, how I can help them. I mean, actually, I find with the viola players a lot of the time there's so much practical stuff you can deal with. 
Mm. Technically, that in a way, in a way, I sort of to answer your question about sound, I honestly think if you've got like a strong enough idea of how to play the instrument, then if you have an interesting ear, you'll you'll make your own beautiful, great sounds. Um, and I, yeah, I really yeah. do think that I, th I think actually playing an instrument to the highest level is just it's really hard. It just takes a lot of understanding of how to achieve things. There's no magic, I don't think, to making to making a great sound. I don't know. I don't think so. Anyway. Yeah, but that's because you know how to do it. But it, it sounds like you're you're constantly on the search. So you're you're never quite satisfied and and that's something you you keep looking for when you practice in in your daily practice as well um oh in terms of playing absolutely uh, you want to keep at a very high level when you play yeah absolutely i mean i kind of like a lot of my friends and colleagues i relate to this i think basically when you start when you open your case every day it's like ground zero <laughs> it's ground zero you know what it's like <laughs> it's oh my god yeah it's it's so yeah. frightening <laughs> yeah. you just have to respect that process there's no you, you do a good concert and then it's terrible you know you just have to you just have to respect the process of just always making sure that you're playing well you know and looking after the certain principles in your playing which are so important mm. and it, you know, it's, like, you... it's like any sport you have to practice you have to yeah. practice and and did you find that uh, teaching actually helped your understanding of, of uh, playing the instrument? So did you learn from your students? Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. I, I really enjoy teaching. I think actually it does, it keeps you in a very organized place in your head because you're talking about very fundamental things all the time. And those are, those are the first things that disappear when you're uh, busy and you're stressed and you have when life starts, when, when those things go, then you're completely, the building starts to wobble, you know? Yeah. You've got to have a strong I, foundation. I, I always found that I was more organized in my teaching than in my own practicing and playing. <laughs> yeah. so in other words, I, I never practiced what I preached. <laughs> yeah, difficult, I know, it's difficult. But um, but yeah, no, I enjoy, I enjoy teaching for that reason. Um, and yeah, certain pieces of repertoire as well, it's nice just to sort of think about them um so yeah it's it's a it's a constant process i think playing um and in terms of sound i think it's like i think every piece of music in a way has a different set of requirements doesn't it it's um you don't want to sound the same in everything i guess that's the challenge i find well that's because you're such a creative person i mean i know enough people who are perfectly happy to reproduce their one sound that they can make as long as it's in tune and in rhythm yeah, <laughs> then they're, well, they're quite happy <laughs> yeah and in a way i mean this is where i'm really conflicted because i i do think you know to be a sort of if if you're if soloist is your only profession and you go playing brahms sibelius vorjak concertos every night then there's a certain requirement just to be to be reliable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what it's like. I'm sure you have it. You have amazing soloists coming to your orchestra, but how many times is there? A, is is every performance different? Quite not every artist. No, usually the different. We we often we will play like three or even four concerts and yeah. more if we go on tour. Yeah. And uh, I especially remember. Uh, a tour of the United States and we played with Hilary Hahn and of course she's she's the most amazing violinist I mean just her what she can do on that instrument is so incredible but incredible. literally I could not tell one performance from the other and that there's I mean I admire her for it for this quality of being able to reproduce perfectly perfectly every day without shedding even a drop of sweat i mean she just and it was shostakovich it was like really hard and and she mm. just did it she nailed it every night that was Amazing. incredible but but uh, to, to me that's almost like inhuman and i'm sure she 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 worked really hard for it and and she she yeah. deserves all the respect for it but i i think i couldn't try to to play a scale the same way twice even if i tried yeah and that's difficult because in a way that has become the requirement hasn't it to uh, to sort of play at that level of perfection because that's what we expect now um and again i feel lucky i'm I'm not in that world where i have to repeat the same pieces every night 
and indeed I'm doing so much new music now where it, your job is to create something um, so yeah I, it's a really interesting conversation because yeah. I have so much respect for someone like Hillary anyone who plays at that level but actually I have a lot of respect for people that can do it differently every night yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. Very, it's very rare very yeah. rare and uh, it's a conversation as well I mean at the end of the day you know, music is a conversation if you're playing with an orchestra or not. And the conversation has to be different every time. I mean, you, you can't just play. Uh, it's short, It's less interesting to play a concerto the same. Yeah. yeah. Orchestra. yeah. Anyway, that's another whole other conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, just one more question about your students, because uh, what do you what do you tell them in times like these? I guess you're teaching online now. And, and yeah, and I, yeah, and I'm going to Zurich still, but yes, yeah, I, I'm online mate, at the moment. Yeah, and how are they feeling? How 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 are they coping with this situation? Do they need encouragement, or are they optimistic? And do they think, oh, this will blow over, and then I can pick up my my dream, and and I will be a a great player in an orchestra or a soloist or whatever. Um, I think so. I mean, I th it feels to me like that that dream is still attainable. I mean, it feels like orchestras are kind of, particularly in Europe, it's amazing. Orchestras are kind of working a bit, no? So, I mean, it doesn't feel... I think they're okay. I think they're okay. I think there's, a, there's enough things to be doing now. And actually, my school in Zurich has been amazing. They've really kept going through this and the exams have continued um the auditions have continued and so in a way the school life feels as, as if it's still quite healthy um but of course it's a worrying time for everyone i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't expect people to not be melancholic at the moment yeah um but i do think you know with my students there's a lot of work to do this is a good time for them to just keep practicing and and discovering music learning music I think you, you you are also a great example for them the creativity you are using and and what you, what you do, so I'm I'm sure they get a lot out of it. Uh, yeah, let's see. Let's yeah, see. yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, Brexit. Uh, of course, uh, it's it's something it's been chewed over for years and years, and probably everybody yeah. is sick of the topic, but. I actually haven't spoken to anybody of your level and who who is an international musician. And I just wondered, what's your take on it? How is Brexit affecting British music life now? And what do you expect for the future? Um, I think it's a little too early to tell now, because, of course, it's literally just the last few years. I think I mean, the worry, of course, is that it will be harder for um, harder for British musicians to go and play in Germany and France and Holland. But I, I feel it's kind of early days. I, I, I kind of I'm positive in that I think it will be it will be OK to go and, and play in Europe. Mm. Um, and I think already it's it's fine for people to come into the UK and play. Um, but of course, at the moment, the biggest the biggest sadness is the fact that the concert halls are all closed and, and in the uk we have such a we have such a crazy system where the government doesn't really support any of our concert halls so they're, they're unable to open because um because the rest of life is not happening with the restaurants and all of these things um so in a way the uk is kind of distracted on the arts front at the moment but of course brexit is a big worry um it's a great great tragedy it's a great tragedy for my lifetime to see that and my children to see that. I hope that I hope that things will start to come closer again in the next few years. I, I th I'm quite positive that, of course, we will still travel and uh, <laughs> perform in Europe. But let's see. I, I certainly I think there'll be a period of, of sort of um, confusion and, and readjustment. But I mean, I don't know in terms of your orchestra, or an orchestra in the Europe. I don't know if it's if it's more hassle for them to book a UK artist at the moment uh, because of paperwork. I, don't I think if if you talk about the top level like yourself, I don't think it will uh, make a big difference. I, I think probably uh, 
I mean, the, the biggest the biggest point, I think, of music life in London was that it was really the, the musical capital of Europe in a way. Mm. Like it was also for for the finances. It was also for music. I mean, like everything was going on in London and it was yeah. a place to be and it attracted a lot of students and, and mm. uh, so but maybe you're right maybe it's too early to tell if that will change at all maybe maybe it will just stay and and musicians are usually creative and and then maybe they will work out a way and but yeah I, I hope so I mean but of course you could also paint a very very dark picture about it I mean I do they stopped the Erasmus exchange system now. So students, yeah, for example, you know, these just tragic, tragic things happening. Um, but I think it's very early to tell. I have a feeling that over the next six months, certain arrangements will have to be made for certain, you know, professions to keep working. And I hope that that's what will happen. Of course, if that doesn't happen, it will be an even bigger tragedy. But let's let's see, see what happens. But, you know, it's it's uh it's yeah i mean brexit is a whole whole other conversation but it's it's a it's a great um sadness for me and i, I but as a british person that you could sort of see it coming there was certain sort of uh warning signals over the years and uh and i you know i'm a musician who travels so i'm very blessed to work with german orchestras to go to america you know you see the world as a musician as you do and yeah. you feel very lucky because you have an overview of it but when you come back to your country, it's very easy to see the sort of small, the smaller mentalities at work who feel that it's better to be apart from Europe instead of part of it. And it's just craziness. Of course, we need to be part of Europe. I, I think we live in a time of great confusion and probably the Internet has something to do with it. Um, yeah. I mean, today, now, as, as we speak, officially, the United States are turning into a banana republic. And I don't know if you heard the news, but uh, the, the, some people have stormed the capital. Yes, I just, I just so, saw this. Yes, crazy. So, so uh, there is a kind of trend to, to, to look for, for people of your own kind. So, so yes. to, to sort of build walls and fences and so i think the brexit is just part of that trend and and of course trumpism yeah. in the united states and and the, the nationalist movements in holland and and, course, in, yeah. and all over the place i mean I, i'm yes. originally from austria and i remember when when the first successful nationalist uh politician uh gained some power in austria I mean, there was hell was breaking loose all over the place. It was uh, Jörg Haider then. And yes. I, I remember that I was called by, by the Dutch radio and they, they wanted because they, they knew I was Austrian and they asked, yeah, but how about this? How, how is this possible in Austria after the Second World War? And this, how, how can this kind of nationalism flourish? And he was just one of the first. And now many, many have followed and you, you have your examples in Britain and yeah. And I, I'm afraid it has to do with this unsettling element that that uh, internet brought. I mean, it brought a lot of connection, but also a lot of confusion. I yeah. think I think many people are very confused. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you know, the answer isn't to leave Europe. I mean, that was the stupidity. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and also, I mean, the whole European Union. It was it's a peaceful concept. It was set up to keep world peace. And to leave that is such a is such a um, arrogant gesture, in my opinion. So anyway, to answer your question, I think I think it's early to tell, and I, I think over the six months, next six months, it will become it will become there'll be a practical solution how we we move around, and I'm sure I'm sure we will both be travelling to to different countries, you know, the yeah. UK and like. Oh, it's it's so nice to hear that you're so optimistic. I mean. Uh, I... Many people are are very worried, and is especially now with this double whammy that uh, that you are having in Britain now with with COVID, which is terrible, and the Brexit, which is terrible for many people. So, yes. and and uh, I mean, it's understandable that some people are are quite uh, melancholy about it, of course, uh, of course. as you put Absolutely. it so elegantly. 
Yeah, no, it is. It's it's a very worrying time. But again, just coming back to the the whole point of your your podcast and everything. I mean, what else can you do? I mean, we could sit here for the next two weeks and talk about the bad stuff, mm-hmm. but actually, that doesn't change anything. I think I think this is a time to be creative and to just keep thinking. You know, and um, I I think politically that will will always win through and I think creatively um, people are doing amazing things at the moment and I'm you know I just want to keep thinking about that side of things as much as possible because the other stuff I can't do anything about <laughs> and, and you are really a, a shining beacon in, in that uh, tell us a little bit more about your lockdown commissions because uh, I saw some really fantastic stuff I mean this piece by Salonen for for viola and drone <laughs> for example yeah. this yeah. I, I mean how crazy and how wonderful is it just tell us yeah. a little bit more how how did you get there how, how did you get to the idea yeah well so the the backstory to it is that about two years ago I started a a thing called the viola commissioning circle which is basically what I wanted to I've got 10 viola concertos being written for me over the next 10 years um, and the viola commissioning circle is a way of sort of inviting people who want to support new music and help commission new music because I was always frustrated how long it took to commission new music as you know it takes like four or five years um, so the viola commissioning circle sort of underwrites commissions and it helps new music get written. So the first piece written for me was by Tom Adesh and they paid for it. And then, um, I mean, the structure is more complicated than that, but essentially it's a way of getting new music written. Um, so when the lockdown happened, I decided to use this viola commissioning circle as a way to commission short viola pieces for me and film them. And that's what we did. So, you know, I, I worked with a lot of composers. So I, you know, I called a lot of friends and I, I asked various people. So this is the journey I'm on. So Garth Knox wrote a piece for me and Esther Pekka wrote a piece and Salonen, Bert Whistle's going to write Thomas Lachia, lots of people. And it's become a really beautiful thing. It's a way to, it's a way to ask a composer um, to write a piece of music for you and the space not just for me. So, for example, we filmed it at um, the Royal Festival Hall, one piece. We filmed it in Oldborough at Snape, um, in Edinburgh. We've been filming everywhere. And it's interesting how those spaces have a, a natural sort of sort of aura to them. So these pieces are written for these empty halls. Um, and that's an interesting journey because, again, like we said at the beginning, it's completely separate from doing a concert. The, in a way, these pieces don't really exist in the concert hall. They, they kind of exist on film and they were written for film. And I'm quite excited by that. You know, yeah. it's like pop, pop music has used music video for years. It's their biggest art form. Jazz uses it, but classical music has never, ever used music video. It seems to me. Oh, no, it, ha- it has, but but, uh... but not very well. <laughs> Well, there are some some examples, of course, of, of uh, music films which have been made in, in artistic ways. Uh, mm. Ken Russell, for example, uh, the, the, the very, very impressive uh, films. But Sure, but, these are a bit different. But what I mean is just like, a, like let's say you take Michael Jackson. I yeah, grew yeah. up with Michael Jackson. Let's say you take like Thriller, you know, Thriller. Yeah, yeah. thriller. You know, is it is it a great music video or is it a great song? You can't distinguish. It's both. They, they, they coexist together. And I sort of, I mean, that's a bad example, but I think um, it's interesting to see what would happen if you, if you took a piece of music and it existed on film for classical music. And I, I'm interested in that. I don't know which Hollywood actor that said that he was one of the uh, ones who earn a lot of money, I'm sure. Uh, he said, if Richard Wagner would live today, he would be a film producer. And, yeah. and, and uh, it, it makes sense, uh, really. So, so yeah, I like that. That's very good. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think you have a, a very, very good point there. Especially if, if I look at the usual uh, classical music streams, of, of uh, especially orchestra music, then, then you see people playing in orchestra. 
and if they hire an expensive producer, then he knows uh, which musician to point to at which point, and the yeah. cameras are nice and the sound is good, but yeah. it's pretty much uh, predictable. And, 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 but okay, I'm, I'm not the person that they're made for, so, so I, don't, uh, I don't watch them or not, not much, but um, there must be, there must yeah. be more creative ways to, to yeah. make music. I mean, you know, again, going back to what I said about the viola, I just sort of, for me, every day is ground zero. So I'm happy to admit that, you know, we got it wrong on everything. So I would say, <laughs> I would say, why is it so bad to take an incredible world-class orchestra like the Concertgebouw or Berlin Phil, go to a football stadium and film a 10 minute orchestral masterpiece in an amazing way. For me, that's not, that's not um, cheapening the music. I think that's a creative response. But I fear that the world we both live in with classical music and the audiences, we're a bit too um, purist for it. And I, that's the one thing that I found in this lockdown that I found myself sort of pushing against this, this certain sort of idea that we live in quite a purist sort of profession and mm -hmm. i feel very grateful but it is a very small audience that we're trying to keep happy i might be wrong i might be wrong but it's it's i'm i'm willing to to admit that maybe that is a possibility yeah i feel a bit arrogant saying that i've been doing a certain thing for a certain person for so many years but there are other people out there who would enjoy your orchestra or my work in a different way and let's let's have an honest conversation about that you know why why does a football crowd have to listen to different music from a conservative crowd or from a wigmore hall crowd how, how are you doing reaching out to new public exactly so i i'm at the beginning of this journey and again i you know i don't have any great aspirations or anything i'm still finding my way but i do find it interesting that for example if i'd have premiered these pieces in a recital in Music Bow in Amsterdam or Wigmore, wherever I probably could have done it. Um, you know, a couple of hundred people would come to that and the piece would exist there. And then maybe I would play the piece again next month. And then maybe a year later they will publish the music. But, you know, to do it online, so many people have seen it. You know, and I like that. You know, I have so many students who all over the world say, oh, I saw this piece please, could we have the music for it, you know? And suddenly I thought, actually, that's a really beautiful thing. Um, and the potential for education, I think, at the moment, with reaching people who maybe wouldn't go and hear you in concert, that's really nice. Um, and in terms of reaching a new audience who don't go to classical music concerts, actually, yeah, I've sort of, I've had some really nice exchanges with people along the way. So I'm still finding my way and you know i i think the bbc are interested in maybe taking some of these films and with my new production company we've got some ideas and i'm just enjoying the journey i, I i'm at the beginning of that journey and let's let's see how and who we can reach with it but i think in life it's just good to have an honest conversation and i i wonder sometimes as a classical musician we don't have the right conversation about audiences and um and uh, younger audiences. Yeah. And uh, you said you had some ideas with your production companies. Would you like, or would you be able to share some of those ideas with us? Yeah. Because, um, I, yeah, it seems like like uh, this is certainly an interesting path, which potentially can reach uh, uh, many people and, and new audiences. Yeah. So, so I, I'd be and and actually I've been trying to do the same in a different way than not not so much with with productions but with uh, live music. Yeah. So Great. What are your thoughts? What are your ideas? Well, I guess while we're still in this period of lockdown, and let let's be honest, it could continue probably beyond the summer, possibly. Let's see. Um, while we're in this period, it seems to me that if you're a creative musician, the only thing you can do is present your work on screen, basically. Um, and so th I think the production company, we did our first production in December, which was a performance of the Bach Chacon, filmed with a dancer and with a singer. 
that had some sort of extra elements to it. And it was again, it was just a, it was a it was an attempt to sort of take a great piece of music and film it in a slightly different way and um, see where that journey leads to. And that's that's the first part of a three part film and the next one will will cross over with a fantastic a fantastic pop artist and the third one might involve an actor um, but I think the idea of my production company and it's called AM Productions as in A-M-E the soundpost mm -hmm. French for soundpost and for soul as well the idea is to connect connect creative interesting people so what I love about it is that it's just a way to explore interesting ideas like we, we're going to make, hopefully, a series of short films of portraits about amazing musicians and amazing creative people um, and sort of do that in an interesting way. Um, I'm really interested in doing some live stream events with, uh, with various creative people in London and just essentially developing, developing creative ideas it's, and putting them on film in an interesting way. That's the... That's the ethos of it, and connecting creative people at this time. But uh, let me be uh, critical now. Don't you think that you will, with those, because I'm sure they're all beautiful, like, like your videos are gorgeous, but mm. don't you think that you're still reaching the same public that we always reach? And, and will you be able to, 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 to pass the threshold to the public which would... Uh, normally go well, which would normally not go to to the Wigma Hall or or to to the Concertgebouw. Yeah, this is the challenge, absolutely. And I, I think, I mean, stage one, I think, is that if if you produce some beautiful content, and maybe your work can go to a platform like I don't know BBC or Netflix or whatever, then already that gets that gets a bigger audience but I agree I mean of, of course what I do is still a very narrow sort of thing but the idea but with the production company is to hopefully sort of expand that and um, do things that might have more of a more of a sort of um, more of a reach yeah yeah um, but you know it's like it's like when you you know the BBC and there's some great there's some great um, production TV productions in the UK Oh, fantastic. You know, of course. Yeah, and I sort of grew up with that. And I, I'm really interested in this idea of short films. Like sometimes late at night, you see these wonderful short films about four minutes long. And I think there's a place, there's a place for, for interesting creative films yeah. on, on TV. But we'll see. Again, it's the beginning of a journey and I'm kind of um, seeing, seeing where it will lead. But certainly the first production with the Bach Chacon, I hope that that might... Um, have a slightly wider wider reach wherever it lands i mean w one of the practical uh, problems uh, we come across is that the average classical piece of music uh, is like half an hour and sometimes it's an hour and sometimes it's four hours like a wagner opera and and uh, the attention span of the average public is of course much shorter and most people are quite happy to listen to one song for for three or four minutes. I yeah. mean, the, the Queen they they already started a, re a revolution by by creating a pop song which was seven minutes, and and it was a big scandal in a way. So so but but I think they were pushing the limits there, and 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 the average uh, consumer of music. I think it's, it's very much tuned into those four or four or five minutes. So maybe your your five minute music films are, are tuning in, in the right. Yeah, uh, yeah of course, and I, I completely agree. And I think Queen is a very good example. In a way, in a way I could put that back at you and say, why, why shouldn't we think like Queen and say, why, why do you have to pre present a whole Mahler symphony? Why couldn't you take a a 10 minute chunk of it and film it beautifully and let that exist there you know why do we have to say we can only present a full wagner opera i mean i think in the in the concert hall that is that exists but when it comes to the attention span of of watching on film 
that's that's more challenging i agree and maybe orchestras could become a little bit more creative with their programming to to allow for that fact yeah maybe maybe but this is the problem this is why we haven't as a profession embraced music film because we have wagner we have strauss we have Mahler, we you know we have brahms and in a way why should we have ever done it because we have concert halls and music video was for pop music and i i just think it's an interesting conversation and maybe there is a there is a middle ground where we could as classical musicians find an expression for your beloved repertoire my beloved repertoire on film i mean for example sorry to interrupt for example how many beethoven symphonies are there now on on the market many 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 there's no room for more let's be honest <laughs> even you know there is no room for more. but maybe the next the next level would be who could film the the beethoven symphonies in a really immersive way i'm not talking about virtual reality although maybe but maybe the next level is to actually let's film the beethoven symphonies with one of the great orchestras and do it really really artistically and beautifully and then maybe that becomes the next great recording of the beethoven symphonies but to expect to just keep recording CDs, it's it's not sustainable, I don't think. Hmm. But I might be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I might be wrong. On the other hand, uh, first of all, uh, there is plenty of people out there who are quite open to uh, to also listen to 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 music which which uh, demands a longer attention span. Uh, and they still yeah. don't come to concert halls. So uh, there have been trends like with special festivals, you know, outside in special setting. So I think there is there are opportunities there. There, I'm sure there is a there is a market also for for longer pieces to be presented to to new audiences. And the yeah. other thing that that uh, I'm thinking now is if. If people go to like a rave festival or to a, to a, to a house party, then then they will quite happily listen to six hours of of music. True. Uh, and 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 they are quite fine with it. So so yeah. and. But the, yes. I so agree. maybe maybe we're going wrong somewhere. I'm 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 I yeah. don't have the answer, but. But maybe this attention span thing is is not really the no, challenge that we have. I actually, I actually think it's just a perception thing. I, I do think, going back to what I said earlier, I just think the perception of the concert hall is a bit scary for some people. Mm. As you say, they'd much rather go to watch six hours, you know, six hours of some rock group or pop band or rave. They've got the attention span. You're absolutely right. So maybe. Um, Maybe there is a, a another audience to be found there. Um, but one thing I find interesting, though, you know, I'm a musician, and since the whole lockdown, I don't think I've sat down. I haven't got the concentration span to watch a whole Mahler symphony for an hour and a half at mm. home. But I have in a concert hall, of course, it's part of my life. But I I find it very hard to watch these streams uh, at home. I, maybe it's just because you're with the family. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. It's it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, I'm 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 the same actually. I I uh, it's a terrible thing to say, but but uh, I yeah. I don't enjoy listening to to streams, like no. uh, all concerts. I it feels I, it feels quite frustrating in a yeah. way. So and this is what we did at what we did at my festival this year. We decided to I don't know if you saw any of these films, but we. We um, filmed my festival, but in a different way. We sort of tried to do it in a, in a more sort of artistic way. And actually, that was a really lovely experience because actually we came together and we rehearsed and we did just play it through once. We didn't edit it. Mm -hmm. And it felt for us, it was a performance to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what it was, it, we weren't just performing to the empty hall. We were really performing to each other and we, we sat in different ways. And Jesse, my filmmaker, filmed it so beautifully. And I just think that was a really nice experiment just to try and film beautiful, great music in a, in a slightly different way. Um, 
and I had some really nice comments. And talking about audiences, actually, I had some really, really interesting people who saw those films who would never go to concerts. So, I mean, I, you've got to try different things. Yeah, yeah. Could you, wh where can we find the links for, for, for those uh, films? They're all on YouTube or? They're all on YouTube. I'll send them to you. I'll send them to you in a minute. Yeah, because I'll, I'll put them then in the, in the comments uh, on YouTube. That'd be great. Yeah, because I'm 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 sure after all this talking, people would love to to actually see what you're doing, and yeah, no, I'll uh, you. I mean I I very much enjoyed this this uh, lockdown commissions because I love contemporary music, and I thought you were so creative and so so it's so beautiful and and heartwarming to see that 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 somebody is not beaten down by the circumstances and just creates new things out of new circumstances so so well yeah yeah i mean yeah i'll send it to you in a minute yeah i have i have the link i'd send you it's it's all on my youtube on my youtube channel but um okay. that, that was a really nice uh challenge to try and film film my festival in a different way um but it, as i said it's an evolution we're, we're all learning at the moment and i i think we're right at the beginning of a journey here yeah Let's look a little bit at the future. So how, where do you see yourself in about a year's time? What do you think is going to happen? What is your life going to be like? Um, I think, I mean, realistic, I think in a year's time, I probably, I hope that live performance will start again. So of course that will be part of my life again, I hope. But even if it's not, I hope that I hope that I have found a way to stay creative, maybe with this production company of just creating interesting content and seeing what happens. I hope that I'll still be teaching. Um, and yeah, I don't really have any great aspirations for each other. I think you just have to just keep keep working. What well, there was that great quote? What was it? Um, uh, what was it? Oh gosh, I forget. It was like amateurs, amateurs wait for inspiration and professionals go to work. <laughs> something, something like that. It was something like that. And I, I think there's something beautiful in that. You just can't cheat. You know, it's like, uh, where, who was it who said that? Yeah, it's like great writers, isn't it? They, I think a lot of great writers that I respect, what they say is that they can't, they don't wait for the inspiration. This every day, they just have to write something. They have to yeah, go yeah. to their desk. And sometimes, some days they'll write one page of text and one day they'll write 20 pages of text. It's just, it's just the process. You have to keep doing it and then great things will come. And I, I, think, I think like that with the viola and I think like that with all of this journey. I think there's nothing else I can do is just keep, keep trying. I, I think it's a distraction if you, if you think you want to do X, Y or Z maybe. That's just my personal personal philosophy but um i think the main thing is just staying creative and staying positive like you are doing this it's great you've got to keep you've got to just you've got to do something it's, it's you know it's it's a good good uh, example and actually i'm i'm fascinated by at the moment it's quite exposing there are some institutions that are doing incredible things mm -hmm. and there are some institutions that are doing nothing and i i find that really behind these institutions there are great there are some really creative people and um not, you, not everywhere could you name a few examples of things that you really uh that you're fond of or that you admire well i mean i, don't, I wouldn't want to name any institutions but i think in terms of colleagues i think dan danny hope is doing beautiful things with his series at home i mean i think that's a really honest and sort of great production he's doing during mm -hmm. lockdown. I don't know if you caught any of it, but... Um, no, I didn't see it yet. So that's why I'm asking, because that's yeah. the next thing, next thing I, I will go to. Well, I would say, look at look at what Dan Hope is doing with his Hope at Home series, which of course is just a, it's a wonderful sort of thing. And he's inviting all of the most creative people in Berlin to come and talk and play in his house, which is great. Um, what else have I enjoyed? I guess I'm sort of I'm more inspired by the smaller venues who are still doing things, you know, mm -hmm. like in the UK there during the summer, there were certain festivals that kind of didn't do anything. And then there were festivals that just tried to do stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, like in Aldborough in the UK, Roger Wright is fantastic. 
was just pushing and pushing and pushing. And then sure enough, you know, some concerts happened and some people came. And I just like that spirit of, uh, you know, creativity. And I think the festivals and the orchestras that have those kinds of people will be fine. You know, the, you're having those honest conversations about what could we do different now? And and it's actually, it's quite hard to, to change your mentality sometimes. It, it feels, you feel quite sort of threatened or um, disappointed. But yeah, you, just yeah. have, you just have to be honest. And, and also, the, the bigger an institute is, the, the more difficult it is. It's like oh. when the dinosaurs uh, died out, then the little mammals, they survived because they were more flexible. Yeah. So uh, I've had some conversations and uh, I, I, what springs to mind now is this, uh, this talk that I had with Ken Smith, a music journalist. And, and uh, he said, and he's probably right, that some, some big institutions will, will not survive. They will, they will go because, because things will, will change. Yeah. And uh, I think it's creative people like you who will, in the end, will make the difference. They, they will find a new path and they will develop new audiences and find new ways of communicating. And I guess that's uh, what it is Maybe, all about. Yeah, I mean yeah, I mean, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a brutal thing to say, but I think there is an element of natural selection in in the music profession anyway. I mean, when you think when you think of sort of all the recording labels out there, the big like Deutsche Grammophon and Sony, and actually maybe the smaller independent labels are more flexible and kind of doing the I would say some of the most creative projects maybe yeah. um, in a smaller way, and I think yeah maybe we're lucky to be individuals i can see that for institutions it's a very very difficult time yeah. and I, I i do respect that well anyway i'm it's so nice to talk to you and it's so nice to hear your your creative ideas and your optimism i will put the links to to your uh, uh, to your films uh, to right. uh, under this video so people can start looking at them and enjoy it and get inspired yeah. Like I, I, I'm inspired by you and I feel now like I should be practicing and I should be doing things. And, and uh, so it's, it's awfully nice to talk to you. I wish you all the best uh, for Thank your you. enterprise, for your production company. And obviously, I hope to see you at some point and maybe we can play chamber music again uh, together one day. I mean, the, the, Great. I shall never forget uh, this one evening where we read Verkehrte Nacht and, and, and you were you were just nailing it like you're nailing everything. And I was really, wow, I was so impressed. I felt I felt oh, almost all, almost overwhelmed by the by oh. the but anyway, that's that's my my personal uh, I, I, I don't know. So but uh, but uh, anyway, it's it's um, much appreciated. Uh, thanks for taking the time. All the best, and and uh, I hope to see you again uh, at some point soon. Great. Thanks so much, Mikhail. Okay. Good luck with the podcast. Bye. Thank you. See you. Bye. 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 Zooming in on music.